Hi, everybody. Welcome to Someone Gets Me, where your visions become reality. Today, we're going to talk about how to deal with mental turmoil, among some other things. I have an amazing guest here with us today, P. Susan Jackson. She's in Vancouver, and she is highly sought after all over the world to help highly gifted people and all of the amazing struggles they have and amazing talents they have. So I'm so honored that she came here to speak with us today about turmoil and other topics. So you might want to get a pen and paper or be ready to pause and listen to some of her great content. A little bit about her is we met in Milwaukee at a Sangha conference many years ago. I was trying to remember how many, probably nine or 10. I don't uh -huh. remember how many years ago. And I opened the conference and did this really cool thing on joy. And these about five people came up to me and goes, you have to meet Susan Jackson. You have to meet Susan Jackson. You have to meet Susan Jackson. I said, well, I already have that on my list. I hadn't met her yet, but I kind of knew I wanted to know her. So I went to her first talk that she did. And I'm like, oh my, we're like sisters in this cool way. And I'm in Florida and she's in Vancouver, but it's like, we knew each other. It's like, I should have known her all along. So I'm so delighted that She's here with us today to share her wisdom because every time I listen to her, I benefit. She's just a very wise, compassionate person with a mission that is mighty. So welcome to the show, Sue. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> it was really fun. So I'd like to start out a little bit about your own journey a little bit about how you got where you are, where this passion started for working with the highly profoundly gifted and, and, and how that vision comes about. Because I work a lot with visionary leaders and sometimes it's interesting for them to see how it all works together. Well, it's so interesting. I'm in the middle of writing a book and the title of the book is, excuse me, where do I park my whale? the um, extraordinary journey of the exceptionally and profoundly gifted um, and the the title itself came um, to us in the middle of a session with this profoundly gifted young woman who had been valedictorian and she you know she's sort of a, a quadruple threat she's beautiful she's brilliant she's compassionate da 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 and she was at a prestigious university and having a really tough time and um, so I was trying to get her to connect with the deepest part of her and it's over Skype. And so I'm like, well, okay, so picture it. It's like you have this whale. The whale is you, you are the whale, it's part of you. And it's in the deepest part of the ocean and I'm going on like this and the tears just start streaming down her face. And, um, and, and I said, and so it's difficult for you sometimes because your sense of self and your sense of what you can be and do in the world is so large. And the world some, sometimes gives you the feeling you have to kind of park it in a certain way or do a certain thing. And the other thing is you don't want to park your damn well. You want to let it like swim and be powerful and be amazing. And the more I looked into the well me metaphor, which you'll read about in the book, uh, the more it's really, really out for this population. So in writing writing this book, um, I was writing about how my story and how did I get there. And um, I talked about how as a little girl, I went to school and I was reading and writing and doing math, but I literally was the shyest human being on the planet. I was just the most introverted and also very, very shy. And so they picked me up with a bunch of other kids and they skipped us a grade. So there was about three or four of us at that point in time. Then they moved us up another grade. Well, this didn't help my shyness because now we were the little weird group <laughs> but, but the really fantastic benefit of that was we had each other and it was like a little mini Noah's Ark like there was you know the really outgoing crazy guy that got kicked out of class every day and I was the shy poet and there was one of everything and so life goes on and so now I enter high school as an 11 year old and they kind of drop all of the programming and all the support and I'm still scoring in the you know in the high 90s and doing exceptionally well until grade 11 and then I just kind of like fell off I'm 15 as a junior and I just fall off the map I'm just kind of done and I go through university and there's kind of a long story with that but eventually I get a degree and I'm out teaching psychology uh, in the high schools and I meet this young man and um, he comes into the center and he's quite striking. He's got dark eyes and dark hair. And um, I sit down to talk with him. I'm usually pretty good at engaging people. And I'm like, so, hey, be like, hey, Diane, how's it going? And he's just like, uh-huh. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh dear heavens, this kid is so obviously brilliant and so obviously morbidly depressed, like just so shut down. So I come home and I tell my husband, I just blew it. I absolutely blew it with this kid today. And he goes, what happened? And I explained, he goes, my husband's very wise and he said he'll be back. And I go, I don't think so. So the next morning I go to work early to do more investigation on him. And I turn the lights on and he's sitting in the counseling center. He had bribed the janitor, like brilliant dude. And um, he got in there. Um, um, he's actually from Austria uh, and he was 15 as a junior. So very similar to my story. And all of a sudden, and this happened really quickly. It wasn't like I zoned out talking to the young man, but all of a sudden my whole life came into sharp relief um, mm -hmm. because I realized that even though on paper I looked pretty good, you know, I did all the great marks and accelerated and did all this stuff, I still had not really tapped into who I was. And at the same point in time, I had this young man in front of me that if I didn't figure this out pretty quickly, I knew he didn't have much left in the tank. Like he was really depressed. And so it was like, literally, when you talk about the whole visionary experience, it was like I got hit by lightning and my whole life made sense. Um, I should backtrack and say that I'm from a family where we had two road scholars in one generation like our fa in our family high expectations and achievement was just a given um, and I was kind of marching along in that regard but I hadn't tapped into who I was and so I decided in that moment I will figure this out I will figure out the story of the exceptionally profoundly gifted I might not have had those terms because I realized that I had been completely tamping myself down my whole life despite looking on the outside as if I was really switched on so Oh, yes. And, and that disparity of looking one way on the outside, but having a completely different inner yeah. reality is, is so very common. And I think a lot of people, a lot of the people I work with, I'm working with a teenager right now who's almost in that same kind of position. He looks great on the outside, but he's uh -huh. so, so depressed and sad on the inside. And, and when I just started mentioning gifted, he goes to a school where everybody's gifted, so they don't really understand how, it's not a gifted school, it's a private school, but they just don't address it. And he has so much to learn still about who he is, so he can finally drop in and be his authentic self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of turmoil that happens with that in our, in our thinking, in our mind, in our identity and things. And so what are some of the things that, that you did or that people taught you that helped you through all of those situations so that you came out on the other side empowered and aware and awake and things? Because, you know, you know how it is. So many people, they don't, they don't come out the other side no. so easily. No. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I grew up with a lot of very strong women and um, I just uh, over the vacation saw my great, no, not my aunt, my aunt, who's like early 90s and she was one of the first school administrators in the whole of uh, Western Canada, female administrators. And so when we would get our first degree, she would look at us and say, well, that's an interesting beginning what do you want to do next like so when I say high expectations it's a little nutty um so I grew up with strong women and role models for women my mother was a complete trailblazer she was a Jungian psychotherapist and artist and a real trailblazer uh, I grew up with all of this but I still think my story has a little bit to do with being a very shy um, little girl and 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 I happen to have a very very high verbal IQ and sort of an analytical mind and so that wasn't that wasn't what little girls were supposed to be about right, right? like mm -hmm. you know and so and I didn't want to offend and I did you know all of the sort of classic kinds of things so I think part of my story uh, was finding my voice and finding my way with that and actually my husband's a big part of it because he sort of um, instantly understood and got me and is a very grounded individual but along the way I learned many many things um, and one of them is um, taking um, time for self-reflection like like significant time to just kind of dive into and for whatever reason I was never afraid of diving into emotions that were less than you know uh, the so-called positive emotions because all emotions have their place in uh, understanding who we are all emotions have their place I was never afraid of them uh, I was I almost understood that I needed to understand all of that even before I understood the concept of a shadow or all of that um, another interesting thing along the way was I started competitive swimming as a five-year-old 
um, and I, I ended up being a nationally ranked athlete, swam for University of British Columbia, all of that. But the story is less about the athleticism and more about there's a lot of time with your head underwater, contemplative time. Um, and there was a lot of discipline that was inculcated, uh, expected of me, but I also really uh, leaned into that. One of the things I teach my patients uh, that I work with is there you have to have both that self-reflection self time and acceptance of all of who you are, but there also has to be pieces of sort of regulation and boundary making and discipline in your life that is absolutely essential. It's like creating your own beautiful framework for the extraordinary vine that is the exceptionally uh, gifted person to grow within. So whether that's daily practices, um, I also think that physical activity and, and bodily awareness is essential um, for all human beings and especially in our populace. And as a lady who gets up every morning at 4.30 to, to work out and exercise, it's not that I'm so athletically inclined, it's more that I understand that uh, embodied cognition, that the body feeds back to the mind mm -hmm. and, and and there's this participatory um, co-participation between the two. And in our populace, it's very easy to become cognicentric. We're very, re I was very reinforced for being brilliant and, you know, thinking and all of that. I was less uh, reinforced for having a body and being aware of that. So. Yes, I think that going within, and sometimes I talk to people, it's like they live from the neck up. They have right. very little awareness of any of the rest of them. And when I say, okay, let's exercise or move, they, it almost feels rigid to them. It's really, yes. it's trained in, disconnected. Do you notice that it is more common to be that disconnected in men than women? Or do you think it's all across the board? Do you see a, any gender difference? Um, I think there's differences on how it presents. Um, I think that... Um, um, a positive relationship between the body and the mind is tough for both genders, but it pre presents differently. Like little boys might be more inclined to act out, like as a, as a child when their needs aren't being met. So as a little girl, when my needs weren't being met in elementary school, I just went within myself and I was very mm -hmm. quiet. Whereas this one guy in our acceleration group was like kinetic. He was just, he was constantly getting thrown out of the class and right. very sad. Sadly, he passed away in a mm -hmm. drug-related incident, and he's from a really wonderful, supportive family. So his is that sort of tragic, tragic story of even with wonderful parents and wonderful people in his life, nobody understood the profoundly gifted part. Um, and my aunt I was just talking about was actually our grade five, four or five teachers. She had all of us in class and she apologized to me last year at the Christmas event. She said, we just, we didn't know what we were doing with you guys. And I said, no, you did, you did two things really well. They kept us together and they gave us, they used to put us in a room, this is years ago, of course, and we would work on these workbooks. I mean, it's a terrible gifted program, but we had each other and, and we talked and they acknowledged that we were really, really bright. There wasn't that negative stigma. Like we weren't put in a mildly gifted program and then uh, disparaged because we were so far ahead of everybody. Like they were just like, no, this is a very unique group of kids. So they mm -hmm. kept us together. And, um, but um, sort of circling back to your question, I think, um, little girls um, present a little differently like they can present their disconnect with their body will present in psychosomatic presentation mm -hmm. like um, so there might anxiety with stomach ache anxiety with hyperventilation that kind of thing where little boys are going to act it out differently so I see both genders um, yeah very very much so it's just what gets reinforced and what gets seen and accepted Right. right. Yes. I was that shy little girl too. Like when you're talking, yeah. I'm like, oh, every time something would happen, I would go within. And when I finally yeah. started putting it all together and integrating many years later, it was like, wow, okay, this is how it is. <laughs> Cause right. this, this is how it was. So you deal with people that have a lot of turmoil and especially in their lives and in their thinking and in how they're doing things. And what is a tip you might say if somebody's listening to you right now and they're kind of curious about this conversation and they're saying, wow, you know, I have all these kinds of things going on in my head. Where could somebody start? What are a couple actions somebody could take who's having trouble with their thinking or they're just got a lot of turmoil, a lot of junk in their head to help them kind of start seeing their way out of that fog 
to know what to do. Like obviously you have a four year waiting list and there's not too many people with the kind of skill sets that we, yeah. we possess. Yeah. Um, I have a waiting list too. It's not quite four years, but it's the same thing. So what is something that some wisdom you might share with that person listening to us somewhere? Well, I think I would um, start with um, like a, a good researcher. I would start by reading as much as you can about uh, what this exceptionally profoundly gifted uh, journey is all about and um, you know two clicks on Google and you can be into um, any of the, the, the websites be it um, our, our own website is Damon Institute and I'm sure you'll have the contact information up for folks um, to saying to I'm sure you have your work out there um, the group grow gifted research outreach it's doing some more interesting genetic uh, work out of Florida actually um, mm -hmm. looking at genetic predisposition for the kind of experiences we have both in terms of bodily somatic expression of giftedness and high giftedness um, so I would start with like doing all the research but most mostly while you're doing that follow your nose like what what makes the most sense to you what really speaks to you um, my own model is called integral practice for the gifted um, and it springs from integral psychology which is um, championed by a man named ken wilbur um, and basically it looks at um, all these different aspects of development cognitive being one aspect of development mm. one of 32 to 36 aspects of development another aspect of development being emotional another being communicative capacity so when you and another being kinesthetic and yes. on and on and on one being gender because as we move up the lines of development even in gender um, we see um, what we used to call androgynous they might call it gender fluid now uh, behaviors and that's really really common in this populace so it's like follow your nose but not just in the research that's looking at intellectual development because that cognizantric bias can actually constrict the system and, and kind of run against you. So look at all these aspects of development. Um, and then I really would stress daily practice. Like if every day, whoever's out there, if you can just start with some moments to really just take, you, it, it, it could be so simple, even two minutes and a, you know, a journal and try not to think about all the pages in the journal that are empty, just see the first page and, and just write a little. Right, and if you're not a writer, you can record a little. And if you're more of a musical person, I have a young man right now. I'll probably start crying. Um, he came to me, and he was very. Um, I'm going to be very general, but very shut down. I'll just say. Um, and um, the last time he was here, he was in the waiting room playing the accordion. Um, oh, no, for whoever else was in the waiting room, Christmas carols, um, because in the treatment process, I found out he's this profoundly gifted musically and he taught himself piano and i thought the choice of the accordion was really lovely because it's very fun and it's very it kind of has interesting cultural connections and so that was his way of expressing so he might not be journaling every day but he's practicing every day um actually our own son who's now living in toronto decided to take up guitar at how old he'll be 29 on sunday so he was 27 taught himself music theory and played for us this christmas and it was just truly extraordinary but he practices as much as four hours a day now that's a real commitment so those of you that are out there I'm saying just two to two to five minutes just sit play music sit with yourself sit in nature do a little writing but commit to a little bit of time every day for sort of self-awareness and self-appreciation while you're doing it pay attention to your breathing mm -hmm. so you know in through the nose hold slowly out through the mouth because in the um, literature when they're describing exceptionally profoundly gifted persons typically as i'm reading it i'll say oh they're describing what they consider normative uh, experience but really this person is running in in anxious mode um, it's very typical for exceptionally profoundly gifted people to be anxious in some way their whole lives because from the beginning it's difficult to find the mirrors like 
I, I remember my first day in, we had grade one, we didn't have kindergarten back then. And I'm ha it wasn't even recess. And I was like, holy crow, mom and dad made some terrible error. They've dropped me off at this place. None of these kids are reading. Like some things, like I'm like, I'm not, I wasn't angry at them. I was like, I think they just got the wrong place. <laughs> and by day two, I was like, uh oh right this this is it right uh, so the mirror was not there I was there like wow school is gonna be amazing and it wasn't and I had a lovely teacher so from the beginning you start to get slightly off of your natural responses I mean what are your options if you're fully reading and writing and have high numeracy if the other kids are learning the letter B you know do you stand up and start howling that's how you feel because I'm here to learn. So what happens in not so uh, subtle ways is you start to get out of whack with your own instincts. And so as an adult, if you have inner turmoil, we want to get you back to paying attention to almost the pulse of how you think and feel and learn. So just starting off with a daily uh, practice of self-reflection. It doesn't have to be a big thing. And also go into it every day just with a commitment to go into it every day. Try to avoid the analytical aspect, says she, who is very analytical. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's the practice of doing it without all the judgment and the, and mm -hmm. the conversation and all of those extra yeah. things, because it's really easy to talk our way out of it or make it something different than it is to just be in the moment. Because like you said, it's a whole different reality. And so, I, I mean, I remember when I learned that I had been anxious my whole life. Like I never knew that I can remember any kind of normal for a very long time because I thought that was it. And yeah. then I started realizing and learning that it wasn't it. And it was a whole nother journey to go deeper to set what, see what the real set point was. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, I think that that's a very, very wise um, information. And so how do you um, coach people or help people out with not being able to sleep really well? Well, when you get to the point where you're lying in bed and you're not able to sleep, that's sort of the end point. That's like the train that just stops. You have to go back to the, where you're buying your ticket and your intentions for your journey and all of that. Um, and um, so um, we have to look at what that looks like. So if we look at, I'm just looking out my window, we live on almost two acres and it's really beautiful, um, um, is like how much is any individual listening to this no matter where you live even in the in the city how much are you actually out in nature and getting some vitamin d if you have the luxury of having sun in the pacific northwest um like but how much are you getting outside how much are you out and moving in nature in your day and again I'm speaking to people who have all kinds of lifestyles, but if you can carve out even that 10 minutes, the research shows pretty strongly that 10 minutes of sunlight before noon is very important for sort of resetting biorhythms and, and helping with what I'm calling this sort of low grade anxiety that is so pervasive in this populace. That's one. The second one is, one is some kind of exercise program, like whatever it is. And I, I go to this gym locally and uh, a woman joined recently and you could tell she's very nervous um, and um, so I try to make a point every day to say something encouraging without looking like some manic exercising crazy person and just compliment her on her participation or complain about my own lagging spirits or whatever it would take to make her feel good and she keeps she keeps coming back and you can just see the light coming back into her face and again that can be daunting for people who have um gotten out of touch with those rhythms a little bit i'm working with i work all over the world so i'm working with someone in another continent and i'll keep this very very big and but it was very difficult for him because he was a little bit of a shot in and um so we talked and we talked and eventually we agreed he would just get up twice a week and just walk to the post office box and back and you know that story if you pick up the calf when it's tiny eventually you're picking up the, the full-grown bull so you just start slowly so exercise would be one that the third thing because I'm very much a believer in starting at the bottom of the hierarchy uh, if you want to be sleeping well you have to look at all aspects of your physiology and your environmental interface so the next one would be food um, what kind of foods are you eating are you eating um, and each person their biochemistry is so different 
recommend, but we do know that avoiding simple sugars and um, really increasing your uh, vegetable load and watching the kind of proteins you eat, that kind of a protocol is really important to, to sleep. The the uh, fourth thing would be screen time. Um, ample, ample research, and it's not just the blue screens, it's just time on screens can really uh, interrupt um, the body's ability to decompress and unwind and move into sleep. So if you can avoid screens close to bedtime and really have a hard look at how many hours you're spending on screens, and some of us have jobs where we're very screen heavy and the world is beautiful because we can connect with people, that's one wonderful thing um, but are you also balancing that out with time in the world away from screens um, and then I guess moving to the like closer to what do you do, actually do for sleep the the room that you sleep in is very important um, my son will probably kill me but anyway um, when he was little um, we we were we had the luxury of the kids had their own rooms not everyone does and we just stripped his room like we didn't have very much in there at all because all it would take him would be one book or one stuffed animal or whatever and his imagination would just take off so we kept it pretty clean and pretty muted colors so it signaled to the, all the sensorium, it's time to rest. I talk to kids and to adults about the importance of sleep. It's, the research is so strong that quality of sleep and getting the right amount for what your body needs. I happen to be someone who doesn't need a lot, but some highly gifted people need a lot. It's, there's a real variance. So paying attention to the room you're in, like um, sort of decluttering and making sure uh, it has the right aesthetic for you, but minimal stimulus so that the body knows it can let go. And then finally developing a relaxation practice when you're lying in bed and you can, you know, all of the, there's all kinds of apps for that, whether it's uh, soothing music or um, relaxing from the head to the toe or, uh, and just really paying attention to the inner kind of messages you're giving yourself. Like, um, you know, just the whole idea of letting go of the day and I, uh, the thing I love about being profoundly gifted is I can always say to myself, when I wake up in the morning, there'll be so much that will have been figured out. <laughs> it's like, like the brain loves working. And so I'm at it while I'm sleeping. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it's just like outsourcing, <laughs> right? Like right. Outsource to the unconscious and just like let, let, it, let, it, let it roll. Exactly. And then, and then if you are struggling with sleep, my favorite one for this, with all apologies, to the organic chemists in the world, one of whom is my patient, um, is get up and read the most boring thing you can think of. Because um, the brain will, like if you can't sleep, legitimately get up, go find something that you don't find at all interesting. And um, the body will just sort of kind of react. And, you know, it'll want to shut down and not take in that stimulus, making it easier to, to sleep. Yes, so. that's what I do. I have a, a book on my phone that, I have no interest in, and it's the most boring thing that I can't even get through a few sentences before the phone's back down and I'm sleeping again. Like, yeah. Oh, it's a, quite a powerful. I went I from waking up to staying awake for a couple hours, thinking, 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 to now it's like three or four minutes. Yes. Like it's almost nothing now. And, yeah. and I, I, um, I just thought, well, what could bore me? And I'm like something, and that's what I'll do. I'll do something boring. So that's, yeah. it works, which you said yeah. works perfectly. And I think the messages in your brain are really important, like your inner voice. Like I'm always like, oh, it's time for sleep now. I need to put the day to rest and I'm excited for tomorrow. And I, I need to let my whole kind of engine body and mind relax now. Um, because I don't know what you're like, but I hear this from kids and adults all the time. Like, wouldn't it be cool so if you never had to eat and you didn't have to sleep? And I'm kind of like that. Like, I'll forget to eat because right. I'm so cur I'm writing a book. I'm doing this I'm doing that and, but that's like a terrible terrible role modeling for the kids I'm with um, because whatever pattern of eating you need you need that sustenance for all parts of you so sleep is the same way like I would love to stay up all night that would give me twice the amount of time to do everything um, but <laughs> right. um, it's degenerative over time right right and the idea is not to degenerate and age much faster than we're meant to by mm -hmm. pushing and pushing. It's, it's about learning how to be in the flow and, and making friends with ourselves, you know, and having some compassion and love along the way here. Right, absolutely. Especially like when you mentioned earlier about having the mirror. So I run into so many people who they don't have too many profoundly gifted people or other visionary types or even any gifted people of any, any part of it around them really. And 
And that can get very tiring and feel pretty lonely. And sometimes I work with some people who've got into that thread of beating themselves up because they were different and there wasn't any kind of ex explanation or understanding yeah. about the difference. And so yeah. they internalized it as something's wrong with them. Right. Absolutely. And so I'll say, no, it's something's right with you. And they look at me with this shock and relief and, you know, and all the emotions coming through at once when I start describing what their life has been like. Yeah. And, and so do you, um, have any neat ideas about what somebody could do to have a little bit more self-love and self-compassion? Yeah, it's funny. Um, when um, I was purchasing Christmas par presents for our kids, we have our, our daughter is 32 and our son will be 29. They're, they're like, oh, I wonder which of the 15 books mom will give us this year. <laughs> so um, uh, I for myself, while I was on that journey, I picked up the um, biography of Robin Williams just entitled Robin. It came up two years ago. Um, and then I picked up another one, Dancing on the River of Life or something like that. Um, and the subtitle of the second book um, was the life of expression uh, and I'm really 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 big on that like finding ways to just express yourself um, I'm a real student of the uh, Persian uh, mystic poet Rumi oh, I've yes. been studying studying him since I started doing very strange things as an 11 year old one was studying mysticism because um, I was trying to make sense of a lot of my experiences with different levels of consciousness and um, um, so this this book the subtitle of this book was you know expressing yourself and rumi says let the beauty you love be what you do and so i encourage all my profoundly gifted patients and i literally see people in india um holland uh, africa south america all over north america so across cultures is get the kids to follow their nose that's how we ended up with an accordion player in our waiting room and um one kid came in and he was really drawn to the whole study of mycology um he's not the kid in my documentary it's a different kid um and so i said you know let's follow that up and he ends up being the president of the mycology club and most of the other people in the club are in their 80s and here's this 14 year old in there so so really following like what you're interested in and in, in what draws you in and they're often very unusual kinds of things and what you'll find is you'll find other people i mean it's that age-old thing that you know what you're interested in you're going to find other people that you can connect with um, because that loneliness of being you know in the world and i always equate it to sort of a linear analogy but it nonetheless like a high rise and profoundly gifted people are sort of penthouse dwellers mm -hmm. um you know you you see the whole picture and you, you see from high up and i can zip down to the 22nd floor and cope quite well you'd never guess at a cocktail party or whatever i can do very well but it's exhausting uh it's really exhausting whereas if i get to be with people who are on sort of similar wavelengths it's just unbelievable because communication back to my theory communicative capacity communication between two exceptionally bright people very different cadence very different nuances very different yes. subtle energies there's a subtle energy um, that is expressed so again just finding all the means of expression um, and also if there's a way you can contribute in whatever way in your community so it's sort of the opposite instead of expressing yourself and going contemplatively into yourself just go out and do actually my older sister um, she was at the same Christmas party she'd come over and she's running some soup kitchen on Vancouver Island which isn't too far from where we are and her stories are unbelievable like she just started it on her own it's not with any group and she's got this whole community involved in it and she's made the most fascinating characters and um, so for her finding her way as an exceptional person was that contribution right on the ground um, but I really want to reinforce I have tremendous compassion for people who are feeling unseen and unheard and lacking that sort of reflective yes that's a, that's a super tough place yes i have so many people that when they come to see me they leave the first time and go wow somebody finally gets me which is how i named the podcast someone gets me because yeah i thought that was brilliant you know i'm like wow that's just how it is yeah so i what about adults i i i i've always been wanting to ask you this for a couple of years now adults who are just now figuring out they're gifted you know like even it's saying in different conferences where 
everybody's focusing on the kid and then the adult wakes up and says, oh, that's why I've been struggling my whole life or why I'm dysregulated and how come these yeah. things are going on. And, and they have that epiphany and awareness that they too are gifted and sometimes can feel like they're late to the party or something like, you know, Absolutely. nobody helped me grow. And especially if they're a little older and they're, they're, nobody even used the word gifted back then, right? And so what are some things that you might want to say to the older people who maybe are just now figuring out, like they're listening to us and going, oh my, mm -hmm. that's what's dragging, you know, I might be a visionary or I might see things a certain way, but now you're putting language to my experience that I never really got in that same way. And what would you say to that person who's maybe a little older, like waking up to it all? I mean, it's exciting, and but it's also probably terrifying. Well, it's terrifying, and there's often this um, sort of um, uh, subsidiary grief process, too. Mm -hmm. Like, yes. had I but known, like... Um, um, the range of patients and age is my youngest is three and my eldest like would be in his 80s right and he met his now wife in the waiting room it's the coolest story they're I love it. yeah they're living in mexico and usually once a year he'll say i just had to write to you and thank you for all that you did for me he was a retired university professor in mycology again as it happens um but my my youngest um um, kiddo is three and so when she came to me she had had a lot of difficulty and after two sessions she came out of it because she's three and I know what I'm doing with a profoundly gifted little kiddo and she was just so open and so willing to do the work um, but anyway so now she's out in the waiting room and she's high-fiving people and she's just this amazing little person and she leaves notes they're all over the clinic. I beat Sue Jackson by X points in Monopoly, and she does percentages whenever as a three year old. She's crazy smart. But I'll see the people in the waiting room, the adult or the young PhD student or whomever is out there, and I'll see the pain. And then sometimes they'll say to me, but not often, I'll just know if only I had had help when I was three right or if only i had known what this is all about right. um i would have a very different pathway so i think number one is there's a bit of a grief process and whatever that is like if you need to go for a long walk in the woods and stand before an old tree and <laughs> talk to it about golly gee i'm just finding out something about myself old tree and <laughs> my my roots were there but i didn't understand and i didn't know how things went so that's that's one thing is really paying attention to the, the in it in it might you might have some anger there might be just a, a, an incredible sense of loss i actually talked to a young man in great britain uh, and who had gone for all this help everywhere and it, like it, it, in one conversation i had it like i was just like right. oh da, 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 da. no i don't say that to the individual obviously it comes out over time but he knew he, he he was like whoa you caught every nuance all the subtleties all the connecting pieces the pivots the junctures the lost time um so obviously um informed and excellent um therapy is is a wonderful thing if you can get a hold of it um and but i think the next thing is to really just sort of stop and take stock and say all right with this new language and these new concepts um, I'm going to be like expanding my frame of reference. Um, I'm going to uh, find ways to joyfully express who I am. <clears throat> I'm going to become more accepting of the tremendous range and depth of my complex feelings. Um, I do a whole lecture series on uh, emotions and the profoundly gifted um, and um, I articulate very clearly that the messages were given as as little children about emotions like the little group that i grew up with that we accelerated together our teacher in grade three and mrs wilson um died of cancer in the year that she this is our first acceleration we all thought we'd caused it like we all thought that because we were different kinds of learners that they, that put pressure on her like you know how right. you oh know, yes we, we were trying to <laughs> We were trying to make sense of it. And we thought, oh, maybe if we're better kids and this, 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 this. So sure. there'll be so so even to understand that that kind of emotionality now as an adult coming back 
to the question and, and discovering myself is normal that that transpersonal awareness that feeling connected to not just all people but all things and to nature and to the nature of the world which right now is a is a very um, daunting thing is normal but to bite off what you can chew just to take it one step at a time if there's a way i can attach one of my talks to this podcast it's called 27 strategies um, and i go through each of these strategies to talk about how to live fully and i mean live fully um, i am completely against the sort of apologist approach to being profoundly gifted where i'm just a talking head or a production person an extraordinary performer right. Um, I'm actually reading, as I said, Robin Williams' biography, and I'm weeping as I'm reading it. Um, and several of my kids had been connected to him because he used to fly up to Vancouver um, to play Warhammer, um, which is like a strategy game with little figurines. He'd work with my kids, and I, I, I kept wishing there was some way I could meet him or help him because you can th see throughout his whole story that well, he's out there and he's being, you know, obviously brilliantly funny and uh, expansive in the world he was also looking for a mirror back um, right. and uh, it was very, very he was extraordinarily gifted it was very difficult for him to find as much as anything due to the speed of his processing which again I really I really get that when you process faster than most people around you whether you express it or not it, you can feel like you're in some really warped echo chamber that's not working properly you it's just like a time yourself. warp yeah you hear yourself coming back right 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 well if you'll send me the link to your talk i will put it in the show notes and okay. then everybody can enjoy that and yeah and really learn from it because there, it is so deep and there's so much to it that we, there's no way we could cover it here and so that was a very generous offer so thank you so mm -hmm. much for offering that so I have a couple questions that are a little bit random, but one of them is, what's your most memorable food that you've ever eaten? Um, my most memorable food? Okay, just mm -hmm. give me a second. I made a 10-course Spanish dinner party for New Year's Eve, like two nights ago. And my daughter had been, my daughter is um, an artist mm -hmm. and a humanitarian. And she was in Spain doing an art residency. So um, this was about eight weeks ago and she flew home and she had recorded the village paella um, master teaching her how to make paella so which is a spanish rice based dish similar in some ways to risotto but it's filled with all kinds of like chickens and fishes and it's just unbelievable so she recorded this um, my daughter is not a domestic <laughs> but I was a food consultant at one point so she taught me how to make paella so two nights ago my best friend Sue and I um, made this paella which took it takes a couple of days because you have to cook this in advance and that in advance and it all has to be done just perfectly and apparently it was a big hit but I would say whether that's just fresh on my mind or the herbs were picked from my herb garden because it's very mild this winter so um i would say that's my most recent best dish wow that's amazing and it's a great memory with it too and you use the herbs out of your own herb garden mm -hmm. like, it, like it it brings all the little memory things together you know right. it's so exciting like i'm listening to you going oh that's wonderful oh yes. yeah i love that i love that okay is there anything that I didn't bring up that you would like to speak about or you were thinking about before I ask you some of our final questions? I'm just making sure there's not something on your mind that you really feel led to speak about with helping people with mental turmoil or anything about profoundly, exceptionally gifted people that is coming to you now. I think it's, uh, I, I alluded to it several times, it's a message that um, we can live full-blown lives 
in yes. every aspect of who we are, intellectually, creatively, aesthetically, somatically, um, um, gender, sexuality, all of these aspects of being profoundly gifted. It doesn't, you know, that cognitive capacity, that higher level consciousness affects all of who we are. Now, when I say that, I don't mean it to be a burden. I am not saying that in a North American, you know, reach some goal and win, a, win an award, that sort of idea that we have to achieve. It's not about that. It's very much, if we are, I guess, blessed enough and also work towards finding community in whatever way, um, and some of the online communities are terrific, having said to watch your screen time, it doesn't negate at all the importance of finding our tribes um, however way we can, um, but that we can live full-blown lives and sort of unapologetically, and I wanna thank you for um, having this podcast where I'm sure you're bringing people who are aware of this notion of giftedness and people who aren't aware of the notion but are leading full-blown lives or people who would like to. Um, so just, I guess, being um, celebratory with yourself mm -hmm. and sharing that yes. with other people um, is super, super important. And I guess I, 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 I guess I was just born with the optimistic gene, but um, when you think of the overexcitabilities from the work of Casimir, um, which is this heightened awareness of all things. I was thinking of my herb garden. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of my life. So I'm making this paella and my husband is very grounded and very, um, you know, just one of those sensing grounded on the ground kind of people, but brilliant. And so I go to the herb garden and I'm cutting all these herbs and I come in, I'm like, Bruce, Bruce, you got to smell this basil. <laughs> He's like, oh my goodness. So he smells the basil and I go, how amazing is that? What is that making you think of? <laughs> He's like, he's learned over many years to say something and then and then i am like oh and the rosemary bush have you seen the rosemary bush lately because he takes care of the out, outside he goes yes Sue, i've seen the rosemary bush and i go it's just extraordinary and this time of year and then i dance away and i sort of see him with this little smirk you know um because yes with the overexcited abilities i am incredibly intense and i'm very aware of the fabric of this dress and you know what that feels like or whatever but to yes. teach kids and adults to acknowledge all of their experience but also to see where they can express it and reinforce it in as positive a light as possible oh that's great i have a lot of people that i work with that come to me and they don't even know that they're gifted or that it's a thing and then i start talking about over excitabilities and things and then they look at me like that's not me I, I, you know, and, and they really have a lot of denial around their positive qualities because they've so integrated that it's a problem and, okay. and they have this paradigm that there's all these things wrong with them. And I, and when I start shining light in different places, they can kind of see it, but they, they have that denial and kind of that fight back and things like that. And so that's one of the things I think I resonate with, with you a lot is that we're kind of like the people out here helping people see that we can be optimistic and live on stage and have whatever it is fully alive and emerging through us in a way that's productive and happy that you know we don't have to live closed down and shut down lives you know that doesn't no. have to be that way yeah and i guess the other thing is that sort of um courage um courage to make i guess tough decisions or courage to make a change or to take a risk or right. um um, I think that's really important and courage is not, definitely not the absence of fear. Um, it, it's, um, you know, it's sort of leaning into it, uh, you know, holding hands with fear, um, you know, to make changes and to do things and um, maybe take a risk to express yourself in, in different ways. Um, and, and oh gosh, sense of humor, so important. Like my new assistant, when she'd been here for a week, she goes, she said, this is such an interesting place. She said, all I hear is laughter from one of the treatment rooms, the room I'm in. Um, and it's, you know, it, I have to be extremely careful because people, when they first come, may be in a deep depressive state or their anxiety may be so heightened and so entrenched that it's a rigidity and it's a, a pain, right? So it's not 
the humor has to kind of come gently and it kind of have to has to sneak in but once i can um help uh reignite that in people and i really encourage um people to do that like somebody asked me how i cope sometimes running around in the world well i design cartoons in my head in lots of social situations so i'm talking and having a grand time but really i'm designing a whole cartoon series in my head to cope and i'm not belittling anyone because people are too people are absolutely doing the best they can and intelligence doesn't mean better than it just means different right and, exactly uh, yeah so but i do i design all kinds of crazy cartoons so maybe that's like my sort of a sarcastic ironic self stays alive in there <laughs> well it's funny we should get together because i change everybody's voices so it's donald duck and mickey mouse and everybody has a different oh voice when i'm in those situations it comes out of their mouth regular and then by the time it gets to me it, it, it's some really cool happy cartoon oh, voice <laughs> hilarious <laughs> we could make a cartoon you can yeah, have visual yeah. i'll do the audio it'll be hilarious yeah, yeah that'd be awesome <laughs> watch the two of them <laughs> It'd be, it would be lighthearted, but also um, I think people could relate. Sure. I think people can relate. I think sometimes just saying our truth and being bold and courageous like we are and having the trust and faith in things, mm -hmm. I think that helps be that mirror for some people who are either listening to us now or watching us on YouTube or, or running into us, yeah. you know, because you speak all over. And I want to mention before we're finished about your work, because you have the Damon Institute, you have a documentary film out, you're writing a book, and you're a real champion for really helping people live their best life in, in a world that wants to make everything kind of average. You know, the, the world that, that really wants to kind of marginalize the, the very thing that, that brings up these gifted people, all of us, forward. Mm -hmm. So would you, would you mind sharing a little bit about the Damon Institute and kind of what it's about? I'm going to put the links to all of this in the show notes so you all can check Sue out and follow her on social media. I am on her email list and I read every one of them. They're amazing. Oh, I look fun. forward to your emails when I get them because I always finish, when I'm done reading, I feel inspired and, and re-energized oh, awesome. always. So share a little bit about your institute and, and kind of, you know, all, you know what you do. Okay, so the Damon Institute is actually in a town called White Rock, British Columbia, which is 40 minutes, uh, I guess, southwest of Vancouver, British Columbia, which if you've been to our beautiful home city, is very gorgeous. And it's international. We are on every continent except for the Arctic. <laughs> um, and so folks are going to fly in. Um, I have a gentleman flying in from somewhere um, in January. He'll stay in our town for a week and see me several days running. That's the model that he works on um, I have uh, I had a family fly from Spain uh, last summer same kind of model came for a week I work with I'll just call him little one worked with him for um, a week and I haven't seen him since and I have uh, people um, who are going to work with me over time it really depends on the presentation so I might do online work uh, Skype work with a uh, um, a profoundly gifted person. Sorry, I should have shut that down. Um, oh my goodness. Anyway, I'll keep talking. Um, uh, so, um, I work in that regard, so it might be a local person. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm doing, I'm a psychotherapist by training, and um, I'm doing um, psychotherapy uh, that would involve talk therapy, play therapy, um, narrative work. Um, basically, um, my integrated model, literally in my head, when I'm working with someone, I have a model that spins and rotates and presents like a really like a 3d interactive powerpoint slide on what's happening with the individual um, and i'm going to work in whatever way is needed for that individual so it's both developmental psychotherapy so there's no so-called clinical presentation that would fit into the diagnostic manual of mental disorders mm -hmm. but they're profoundly gifted uh, or exceptionally gifted and i'm going to work with them over time to be sure that all aspects of who they are 
part are integrated um, because in the model there's the core self which is that 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 essence that you're born with um, people call it different things in uh, the christian faith it might be soul psyche and in, in psychology and all the different faiths have a different word for it that that thing that we haven't quite found in neuroscience um, uh, uh, that's what i'm going to work with that's what directs the work so the little three-year-old that came to me was in serious trouble as a three-year-old and i connected deeply with her um, and now she leads the little show she comes running up the stairs and hey susu i got things to share and things to do and so now i'll be working with her developmentally i might see her once a month over you know several years uh, because she's going to change like crazy in all of these areas of development i also do consultative work so i'll um, fly into florida and i'll meet with a school for the highly profoundly gifted and and uh, work with their families and their staff. Actually, I'm going to Grayson School in Philadelphia um, in three weeks. Um, and I do sessions for parents and I do sessions for the staff. And I work one on one with the profoundly gifted kids. Because when you get into that developmental work with profoundly gifted kids, there's no sort of concrete linear formula. Yes. Uh, every profoundly gifted person is as unique as unique as you could possibly imagine the human uh, psyche to be, which is why I find my work so fascinating. It requires me to be incredibly, I guess, um, as aware as I can be and very humble because uh, they're gonna like kind of wipe me out in a session they're gonna be oh well now I'm here and so I have to kind of regroup and the ideas that I kind of had in mind about that individual need to be um, flexible and organic and I need to deeply deeply listen and at times I need to be very very um, almost uh, demanding and strict uh, if I see um, some profoundly gifted people and I, I can do this myself I can go too too deep into something without popping out to get grounded in the world again um, and so there has to there has to be time for those deep dives and that investigation where you're literally lost I lost 24 hours once when I was writing previously and I had no idea I hadn't used bathroom facilities nothing I was just so deep into my process but too much of that is not healthy so it's like so it's um, helping people protect that creative aspect of who they are mm -hmm. and finding out where their unique rhythm needs to be because we're all so different right, right, but right. also asking them to come into the world trusting the world yes the trust in the world mm -hmm. that trust is so vital and so important mm -hmm. that is amazing so if there was a billboard that we were going to put up that had the message from sue jackson on it that everyone was going to see what would you put on your billboard um, okay, so this is going to everyone, not just this populace? To everybody. Oh, the golly. The whole world was, is going to see this billboard. What would it um, say? Um, I guess it would be, um, uh, let's kind of all, it'll be a long sentence because I'm verbose, but um, <laughs> help, help us work together. And I have the spirit of Robin Williams because I was reading his biography early this morning. Help us understand the great diversity in this populace and be open to them and support them and we need to support each other within this populace we need to really support each other too because people present in very 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 different ways right. Um, I think the Big Bang Theory sitcom sort of presents your physics math um, sort of nerd, and I don't use that pejoratively, that's how it is, um, and that's what giftedness is all about. And I think for a moment about our own daughter, who's this artist who expresses just profound, profound expression in a visual way, um, like let's accept all of these Yes, ways yes. profoundly gifted express mm -hmm. not wait till they're you know buried in the ground before we talk about how awesome they were so when you meet an eccentric person just just be a little patient give them a little space um yeah. be open to the possibility take a risk with someone who seems a little different and i guess and as profoundly gifted people we have to take risks and try to lean into our experiences as well hopefully together hopefully feeling linked so you don't feel alone right. that wouldn't fit on a billboard i'm very no. sorry well we could take it and we could wordsmith it down and then put a, <laughs> a little asterisk with the website that would have the rest of the story on it <laughs> that would
would be perfect. I think it would work perfectly. Mm -hmm. And so if you are really resonating with what Sue is talking about, I'm sure you will check out the show notes and follow her and, and learn the different things that she's out there doing and other people that are doing these kinds of things. But I want you to just realize that if you're hearing our voice, there's no accident in it. There's a reason why you're listening to us, especially if you've been listening all of this time and you're still wanting to hear what, what Sue has to say or what I have to say. And it's because there's something about you that's amazing and wonderful that's trying to emerge. So let it come out in its full expression. And we will support you in any way we can. And I'm certain there's other people too if you just start letting it come out a little bit. So is there any final message that you have that you'd like to say before we end the show? Oh, I'd like to thank you very much, Diane, for your work. I, I uh, you know, I very much admire you for your work and your contributions. And um, like thinking of my three-year-old to my 89-year-old, wherever you are in that span, maybe before or after that span even, I want to wish you uh, wonderful good news today. Whatever that good news, however you're participating in life, I hope you can enjoy um, every bit of it. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you for being on the show. And you got to hear a lot about how to deal with mental turmoil and all kinds of other things here on Someone Gets Me. So check out Sue's information and remember everybody to keep your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star and you're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there and be who you're meant to be. And until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well. I trust you enjoyed today's show. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and make sure you ring the bell so you can see all the episodes as they come out. Episodes just like this, meant to inspire you and enrich your life. Until next time, be well. Thank you for listening. I trust you gained some valuable inspiration and information. Please join me and other visionaries in the Someone Gets Me Facebook group. Or for more information on my services and additional episodes, visit someonegetsme.com. Again, thanks for listening.